So when banks look at financing, they do look at what your credit rating is. So your credit rating, that also includes things like your credit appetite um, and also just how you've spent your money, what debt you have, things like that. So I think that the banks are comfortable when they see that your appetite is not a lot. They don't, banks don't like people that have got a high appetite for credit. So if you're just applying left and right for credit, they don't, they don't really like that. But if you are able to manage your debt and there are rules about, uh, well, I say rules, there are guidelines about how they perceive your debts, right? So credit card debt over 50% of your limit is perceived as a very bad thing. So you get rated down for that. Obviously defaults, not paying on time, all of all those sorts of things. And then the only other thing that I could say about that is have a relationship with your bank. I have a relationship with my bank. I've banked with them for a very, very long time. And they have in fact funded all of my properties after that first property, all of them 100%. Uh, and they are my favorite bank, but we're not going to mention their name. Yeah, here tell today. them to pay me the next time you come. I'll I should, them. right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and, I, and that's what it was uh, for me. Like, I, I serviced my debt when they gave me bonds. Um, you know, I, I kept up my end of the bargain. And I think that makes them happy and comfortable to continue that relationship with you. I've never had them turn down a bond application. Nice. But it also yeah. speaks to your ability to take care of finances. I mean, yeah. you are a financial manager by yes. training That's right. uh, in any case, right? Yeah. Um, but your category for the Investor of the Year Award is most growth, yeah. right? What strategies do you, have you implemented to achieve consistent growth in your property investment portfolio year after year? So after my buy to let, I, I still continued to attend different um, seminars, uh, different events, and I continued to broaden my knowledge on things. Like I watch a lot of educational, um, educational videos on whatever the channel might be, whatever social media channels. And besides for that, I also got a, um, a business coach, not just a property coach, I have a business coach. And I think that people understate the value of having things like this. I think in all, in all walks of life, I wish that I had thought about getting a business or career coach earlier on in my career, right? That might've been mm. different. So that for me was a game changer because I think they're skilled in bringing out the best in you because I, I think that they can see what that is, what you're good at, what you might not be good at. Um, and I think that they offer you guidelines, supports, those kinds of things. So um, that definitely helped me remain consistent because I had an accountability partner. The groups helped me remain consistent because we chatted about progress, what sort of strategies, what can you do to amplify your strategy? Where are you stuck? What do you need help with? Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that the biggest thing of all is you have to know what your weaknesses are in yep. your personality and you have to overcome those. So by, by nature, I am a procrastinator because I take a long time to make decisions because I need a lot of information um, and things have to satisfy the criteria that I've put out there. Safety and net. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. So I'm quite risk averse. But the point is to know these things, to get the information you need and to take action. You cannot grow if you do not take action. Right. That was the number one most valuable lesson for me. Decide what it is you want. How do you want it? Right. What does that picture look like for you? And just do it. Mm. So find the property, make the phone call. That property is not going to be added to your portfolio by staying on your wish list, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So how do you decide then um, when you've decided, right, to take mm. action? How do you decide which properties um, are going to be for flips or which okay. properties are you going to hold on to do some buy-to-let? Or is it okay. more of we're doing buy-to-let temporarily until we... Let go of it or what's the strategy then? So very early on in um, property learnings, we learned that you have two main strategies in property. And one of those is a cash flow strategy. So that's making money out of your property. And mm -hmm. the other one is the cash strategy. So that's making bulk amounts of cash. So flips are really nice for making bulk amounts of cash. And obviously cash flow properties are nice for making steady income money. So I think that when you're actually looking at this and getting into property, it's important for you to decide what sort of strategy works for you. Are you the type of person that is going to enjoy um, looking after tenants? If not, 
don't use the cash flow strategy, right? Or do you have people's skills to look after those tenants? Are you okay with systems to manage different things? If not, don't do it. Just get properties for flips and make your money doing that. Yeah. Do you have instances where a deal didn't go as planned? Oh, and, and how did you manage that? And what did you learn from it? My very second property that I wanted to acquire uh, was a multi-let property uh, in, a, in a very, very nice suburb. And I was willing to pay top dollar for that property, in fact, because I already saw the kind of money that it could make. So I entered into the deal and uh, I got Marissa to do my inspection. Marissa has inspected every single property I've bought without fail because I trust her. So she did the inspection for me and... I requested building plans and um, I'd waited quite some time. So we'd started moving this along already. And fortunately, I made use of my attorney to do the the bond um, transfer. I had to make use of their attorney for their transfer, but I had some leverage in this deal, right? And um, I just kept on saying, listen, we're not proceeding until we have the building plans. Like this is, these are my requirements. And the agent kept on saying, no, man, it's okay. You can go. They'll reserve some money aside if there's anything wrong with the building plan so that we can have them drafted or whatever. Yeah. And I was adamant that I was not going to do that. And uh, it turned out that we eventually got the building plans and some of the buildings that they had built, in fact, a very large portion was encroaching on the boundary in the first place. Even the roof was over, was not compliant with building regulation. Uh, which was already pointed out to me in the inspection report. So that's why I did not proceed with that. But I'd already paid transfer duty to SARS because we'd already got into this whole transfer process. So um, I eventually ended up going the legal route to have the sale cancelled. And I waited a full year to get my transfer duty back from SARS. Jeez. Yep. Sure. So yep. what did you learn from that? Is there a way you could have avoided any of that? Uh, well, I could, I suppose, have um, said that I wanted the building plans up front and I wasn't going to entertain anything else. But fortunately, because my clauses had stipulated that I had to have approved building plans. So I didn't just say I want the building plans. I said, I want to have the approved building plans for right. this. This was part of my system. The way that approved conditions. is very exactly. important. There Otherwise, I'll give you the building plans, not approved, and I'll just have to accept that. So, um, yeah, I think... Make very, very sure of your purchasing clauses. Okay. Yeah. So have you, if there was to be another pandemic, right? Yes. Have you decided what sort of strategies you would apply uh, for you to offset the challenges posed by, by a pandemic? So after my buy-to-let property, the, the flip that I held onto for a little while, yeah. I attended a workshop and I sat next to a mining engineer and she's so much more than a mining engineer, right? A, a fantastic lady, in fact. Uh, at, we were attending a student accommodation uh, session and she'd say to me that I've just started my student accommodation. I'm having it uh, renovated as we speak. And uh, she chatted to me a little bit about it. And I thought, this is the kind of deals that I want to be involved in. Not just for the student accommodation, but because of the multi-led strategy, right? Yeah. I think that helps a little bit when you have challenges like people that aren't paying their rent or, um, or that have different sorts of challenges, you know, because you're not losing a full property's income, you're losing a portion of it. So I think that for me, if we did have to have another pandemic again, I am very adaptable, right, to change. So when things happen, I'll easily be able to pivot, look at what other options we can explore for that. So. I do have a student housing right now going into a pandemic. I'm sure that we wouldn't have uh, students attending university again, like we did the last time, mm -hmm. but digital nomads, you know, all different types of people have different requirements for accommodation. So I would definitely just pivot to a different strategy to uh, maintain occupancy on the properties. 